The next bill is House File 1929. Representative Bonner, would you like me to make a motion to refer House File 2733 to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee as recommended? Yes, Mr. Chair. And if it pleases you, I do actually have an A5 amendment as well to get it, the bill in the shape that I'd like it. And I would prefer to run that before um, and get that bill amended and then speak to the bill itself as a whole. Certainly, certainly Representative Bonner. I will move the A5 amendment uh, to House File 2733. Uh, Representative Bonner, would you like to explain the amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and members. Um, briefly, the, the amendment really makes some clear or technical and clarification changes uh, requested by the Department of Human Services. Okay, so this amendment does put the bill in the shape the author would like, but are there any questions for the author on the amendment before we adopt it? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All opposed? The A5, uh, the motion for prevails and the A5 amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Bonner, if you'd like to start the testimony on presenting your House File 1929, and then after your testimony, we'll go to your uh, two testifiers and then we'll go to questions. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we'll start with this. Um, HF 1929 um, is a, a bill that I think is, is long overdue. Um, there's nothing harder than watching someone you love struggle, uh, barely recognizing the person you know and love, wondering if the essence of who they are remains beneath the surface, to feel them slipping through your fingers. Psychosis is a disabling condition that disrupts thoughts and reality, making reality seem fluid and hard to grasp. You may hear other things that are see or hear things others don't, leading to anxiety and depression, pulling away from family and friends. And this often leads to delayed calls for help by as long as 74 weeks on average, only to face a wait list, far too little and far too late. Psychosis can be triggered by conditions like schizophrenia, one of the most debilitating conditions in the world. Early psychosis or first episode psychosis is frightening for those who live it and painful for the families to watch and comprehend. Often starting in early adulthood, we don't know exactly how to prevent these conditions, but we know psychosis is the first warning sign. Groundbreaking research has shown early intervention can dramatically alter the trajectory of the lives of those who experience it. In addition to the human costs, it costs our economy upwards of 155 billion a year in direct healthcare costs and expenses. For this reason, states are mandated to dedicate at least 20 or 10 percent of their federal behavioral health block grant to first episode program. The need is real. The four current programs in the state are overflowing and a wait list of over four months is the longest since the program's inception while only meeting less than half the need. Uh, this bill invests in programs proven to provide better improvements uh, in symptoms, relationships, quality of life, greater engagement in work and school. We know early invention, intervention equals better outcomes before it's too late. This bill expands holistic practices that include family in the recovery to include bipolar and extreme depression and seeks to expand it to meet the need across the state. I bring this bill today as someone who knows the helpless feeling of watching someone I love deeply feel as if they're slipping away. This bill does more than fill a line in a budget item. It provides hope for student or patients and families who desperately need it. Um, I will say, Mr. Chair, there is a summary in your packet that gives a high level overview of uh, first episode psychosis. I also have two testifiers here with me today, Dr. Piper Meyer Kalos and Hope, uh, I hope I'm saying this correctly, uh, Grathwal. Uh, to speak to the bill. And we also have Ms. Abderholden and Ms. Grum uh, from DAMI and DHS here to answer any potential questions. Thank you, Representative Bonner. We will go to your first testifier then, Dr. Piper Meyer-Kalos, if you'd like to introduce yourself and start your testimony, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Piper Meyer Kalos, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Minnesota Medical School. I want to thank you for this opportunity to tell you about how first episode psychosis programs have helped young people in Minnesota. I was one of the original researchers who developed the coordinated specialty care treatment model used in Minnesota called Navigate. Getting young people the right care as soon as pop possible is vitally important to changing the trajectory of a serious mental illness. Imagine for a moment what it would be like bringing your loved one or your child into a mental health center for the first time. What would you want that experience to look like? How could we best help young people get back on track and understand the strange or unusual experiences that they've had? I would like to share one person's story of experiencing the symptoms of psychosis for the first time. When this young person who we can call Jack came to the program, he had run away twice and been hospitalized twice because he believed that people were after him. He was afraid for his life and afraid of the messages he was receiving from the voices he heard. Jack only came to the early psychosis program because his parents convinced him to give it a try. It took several months for Jack to open up about his experiences, but he kept coming back to the program because he was able to talk about what was important to him, which was getting back to school. Initially, his focus was on school and less on his symptoms, but eventually he op opened up about his paranoia and voices because he wanted to get back on track with school. Jack worked with different members of the team who helped him with medication, with his paranoia, and with applying to college. Jack's parents also had a place to learn more about Jack's experiences. In many other programs, Jack may not have gotten the help he needed, but the Navigate program was tailored to meet Jack exactly where he was and focus on what he wanted, which was to go back to school. Did you know that at least that three times as many young people who've experienced psychosis will drop out of school compared to their peers? The experience of psychosis can be devastating to the individual, their family, and the people around them, but Navigate programs can help. Coordinated specialty care or early psychosis programs are comprehensive, multidisciplinary treatment approaches designed to help people right when they need help the most, after the earliest experiences of psychosis. These evidence-based programs help people learn how to manage their symptoms, provide support for their family members, and help people get back to work and school. Early intervention with coordinated specialty care is essential to move away from our costly, crisis-driven model to delivering effective recovery-oriented care that improves young lives and strengthens families. The pandemic has made mental health treatment and early psychosis even more important as we have seen rates for early psychosis rise across the U.S. and the world. Minnesota is leading the way to better and more innovative approaches. Our team in psychiatry has competed for and been awarded over $10 million in research funding support to learn more about the biology and the brain changes that happen during early psychosis. We are building on our evidence-based coordinated specialty care teams in order to meet the needs of urban and greater Minnesota, Minnesotans. We are currently developing a model to expand coordinated specialty care treatment to include treatment for early bipolar disorder to better serve and reach individuals in greater Minnesota using existing resources and funding. Minnesota is seen as a top leader in the treatment of first episode psychosis and has been approached by leaders in other states such as California to learn more about the expansion of our coordinated specialty care model to include early bipolar disorder. As these early intervention programs expand into greater Minnesota, it is important that we serve the most people possible through the inclusion of early bipolar disorder and consider the additional needs of people in rural areas such as housing. Now is an important turning point for these pro of these programs because they are integrated in our communities. People are referred, people referred are getting these programs earlier than they ever have before. The time to expand these programs is now. We know that if we do not fund these programs now, the risk is great, including a much higher risk of suicide and long-term struggles with disability and functioning. This bill will increase fun funding to expand the number of first episode psychosis programs and develop a new early mood disorder program for when someone develops a mood disorder like bipolar disorder. I see firsthand the need for increased access to these critical specialized services and the significant improvements that individuals with psychosis and mood disorders can achieve through these programs. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Meyer-Kalos. Appreciate your uh, testimony. We will move on then to Ms. Hope Rathwell. If you'd like to start your presentation, identify yourself who you're with and start your presentation, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Hope Rathwell. I'm here to testify in favor of HF 1929, a built to fund first episode psychosis and first mood disorder grant programs. Thank you, Representative Bonner, for authoring the bill. This bill will save lives. I know this because the M Health Fairview Navigate First Episode Psychosis Program has saved my life. Um, before the onset of my psychosis, I enjoyed a full and vibrant young adult life. I excelled in school and landed professional projects in the Minneapolis dancing. My psychosis began at the age of 19. I exhibited classic early signs like failing grades on college papers that read as disjointed and disorganized. By the age of 20, I started to experience visual hallucinations paranoia, delusions, and disorganized speech patterns. Drug use combined with biological vulnerability or predisposition and life stressors created a perfect storm that resulted in my psychosis. I stopped being able to keep myself safe. Planning to hop trains in this condition is just one example of how I was a danger to myself. I experienced a psychotic break marked by delusions and an explosive emotional outburst that resulted in a hospitalization at M Health Fairview's Behavioral Health Unit. This led to a smart determination and a state mental health commitment. Followed I, or provided I followed a prescribed course of treatment, enrollment in the Navigate First Episode Psychosis Program, um, placement in an intensive residential treatment program, which we were just talking about. Um, in our last discussion, and uh, continuous sobriety for six months. I believe, I believe this intervention began the course of my recovery. My Navigate therapist helped me with CBT skills to squash my delusions, examine my impulsivity. Under the care of the Navigate psychiatrist, I was moved on to an injectable antipsychotic medication that, effect, <clears throat> that effectively regulated my moods, stabilized hallucinations and executive function. Most importantly, frequent medication adjustment adjustments, thanks to the dedicated first episode psychosis care team, created a fine-tuned treatment over many years. Um, miraculously, I returned to school at the U of M and graduated in the winter of 2020. I live independently and I support myself. I have meaningful relationships and I enjoy the whirlwind of adult life. This would not have been possible without the cohesive and comprehensive treatment that provided an early intervention with long-term treatment. The Navigates program, consistent psychiatric and counseling care made this possible. I still face challenges, but I do not face these challenges alone. I have a support network of mental health professionals within the Navigate team. Without this care, I believe I would be severely compromised and homeless, or God forbid, dead. I'm thriving free of the terrifying reality of being floridly psychotic with constant attention to my ever-evolving mental health needs through the transformative services of the first episode clinic. Many are far less fortunate. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the Navigate First Episode Psychosis Program saves lives. The need to expand the program is dire. Please vote yes on HF 1929, and I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Grathwell, for your Excellent testimony. Uh, you came across very well. I know it can be very nerve wracking when people first testify before us. You did a great job. I want to say thank you so much for sharing your story. 
your journey that you've been on. And I wish you continued success in your continued recovery. So thank you for being here today. And I see that we do have uh, some questions. Representative Baker, if you'd like to go first. Um, thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman. And again, Hope, really nice job on, you know, telling the story of, of what we really need to hear, um, you know, in regards to these early indicators. And I know I carried a bill uh, uh, for NAMI here a few years ago as well with the first episode thing. And maybe my question is with Representative Bonner, you know, we've got a, uh, a short session this year. What we do now really has to keep moving along. I'd like to know what the pathway is uh, with our, our body uh, in the Senate and who is, who are you working with there? Uh, and do you see, I know this was, I thought brought up last year too, and I'm kind of curious what sort of hung it up uh, last year as well. So if you could give us any information, if I'm correct on that, I might be mis mistaken, but uh, what's the path like in our other body? Cause we've got to move quickly on this. Purpose of a Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to say that I, um, <laughs> I think last year we, <coughs> pardon me, we a little bit ran out of time. And of course, you know, we had competing priorities, of course, at the end of session. Um, I will tell you, confess to you, I, this is my seventh hearing of the session, and I have not had an opportunity to check in with the Senate side to see where they are currently at in terms of their status. Um, although I confess I am derelict in my duty, I should have done so before this hearing, but I will be happy to uh, get an update and share that with folks on the committee. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Uh, Representative Baker, any further uh, questions? Just a quick follow-up again, and I know the, the, the pressures of uh, getting things done, especially in a short, short session. This is something that's really critical, and if you can, I hope that we can find a pathway quickly to the Senate, with the Senate again, alongside of it, uh, just because I know that this is going to have to happen. So uh, I, I uh, hope that you're able to uh, do that shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Baker. Uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bonner. And yeah, I would just like to start off by also um, thanking Ms. Grathwell for her courage of telling her story. Um, it takes a lot to put forth that effort to put yourself out there to let others know the need um, that there is within society. And um, piggybacking off of that, I guess my question is, and I guess it's probably more of a statement, but it, but it is a question. I'm guessing with all the mandates and COVID and everything else, we are seeing a drastic increase in the need for funding for programs like this. Am I correct in that assumption? Representative Bonner? And I think um, uh, Dr. Meyer Kalos had some additional information on that, and maybe I'll defer back to her to, to go over that piece. Yes, okay, thank you. Dr. Meyer Kalos, go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Frankie. Um, yes, there, it's true. It, it was interesting. Um, uh, initially, with COVID and the pandemic, um, there was a bit of a slowdown, but it's been very hard to keep up, honestly. And um, these programs, uh, in comparison across the country, that when we started these programs, they've never not had a list of referrals and, and constant referrals coming in. It's getting harder and harder to keep up with them at this point. And, and we do feel like that is somewhat in response to the pandemic as well. Thank you, Ms. Meyer Kalos. Uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm wondering where's the base funding now? How much are we proposing? And if we don't have that number for this bill, do we know what's in the governor's budget? Um, how, how much are we planning on increasing this? And is that also one time funding um, just for this coming up biennium or supplemental budget? Um, is it uh, money coming down from the feds that we need to use up? I mean, uh, how much are we putting into this? Is it gonna be sustainable or are we gonna have to come back and revisit this? Thank you, Representative Frankie. I'll start with Representative Bonner and I think we'll probably end up having to ha call on the department to help answer the question. So, I was uh, just Representative, going, Representative thank Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yes, I think I will need to phone a FED friend. Um, we do have Ms. Uh, Gram from the uh, Department of Human Services here. I know you specifically asked about the governor's budget and some other issues there. And so she may be able to speak better to that specifically. Okay. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Uh, 
Ms. Grom, I know you're out there somewhere if you'd like to hop on and see if you can provide us with some of those answers right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Franke. Um, yes, the governor's budget does include some provisions related to first episode psychosis, as well as um, establishing the um, emerging mood disorder program. Um, the governor's budget for first episode psychosis is actually establishing um, an additional pilot or an additional program. Right now, I believe we have three. Um, so we, the governor's budget would be adding one more program. And I believe Representative Bonner's bill um, is expanding funding for the current programs, which is a need that we see in the community. Um, I don't have the current base funding for our um, for our current um, FEP programs, but I can certainly get back to you with that um, later. Um, and then in terms of the Emerging Mood Disorders Program, this is a provision that the governor supports. Um, and it, we would be um, investing $1 million to create this, this program. And then to also, I believe it accompanies Accompanied with it is a um, marketing campaign to make sure people are aware of the, the program and the issues in the community. Um, so that's ongoing funding that we would be investing in the governor's budget. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Grom. Um, I'm on, so do we have what the increased numbers are for Representative Bonner's bill? Uh, Ms. Grom or Representative Bonner? Uh, and uh, Mr. Frankie, I think you're, are you referring to line uh, uh, 3.1 where it has, uh, where it was deleting line 24 and uh, in 2022, add blank dollars in fiscal years? Correct, Mr. Chair. So what you're wondering to know is uh, if we have a dollar amount for that blank that's out there, correct? Correct. Okay, uh, Representative Bonner, do you have an idea what that dollar amount is right now? And would it also be, from what I understand from Representative Frankie, an idea if these would be one-time dollars or would they be added to the base? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I could, I think Ms. Abderholden is on the line that could speak a little bit more to that blank appropriation. Uh, Ms. Abderholden, would you be able to help us with that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Frankie. So we know that um, one program is about a little over half a million dollars. So that would take that much to start a brand new program. Um, and so we didn't put in the exact amount. If it's less than that, that can just help increase um, the current providers um, to be able to serve more people. Um, we would not want it to just be one-time money because in, this is an evidence-based program. And so it takes actually a lot of time and attention to make sure that the team is together, that it's trained. So they, they are following the evidence-based practices so we get the best outcomes. So one-time money would not be helpful at all. Thank you, Ms. Abderholden. And I, I know that the next stop for this is gonna be the Finance Committee, uh, Human Services Finance. And I would uh, ask that uh, Representative Bonner would be able to work on those numbers to have the uh, numbers and having it added to the base by the time we get to the next stop. Uh, and I'll go back to uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess that's kind of the point I'm trying to get to is, is we know there's a need and we've discussed this in this committee and Mr. Chair and you and I have had conversations about our youth and our adolescents and, and anybody facing um, any type of you know psychosis or mental health issue, whether it's addiction or anything else. And um, these programs that we see for need, my concern is, is, you know, once again, we get them started, but we're not investing properly. And if we have money to invest, that's gonna save us money in the long run. I think that's the prudent thing to do. So I think nailing that down um, going forward would just be beneficial not only to Representative Bonner's bill, but to Minnesota as a whole, because we need to know what we're doing going forward, because I honestly believe that right now we're in a spot where these increases are coming. And regardless of what happens with the pandemic, whether we get out of it, it's ongoing, these issues are gonna start to evolve and we need to be prepared to invest in the places to save us money in the long run. So I, I hope that those numbers are figured out and um, we can move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Frankie, for raising it. I think that's a good policy thing is that, uh, that the policy should be as we're rolling out these type of things that we're rolling them out to be long-term and not short-term. So thank you for that, those comments. Uh, Representative uh, Backer, you are up next. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And, and this is to the author. And first of all, I do agree with Representative um, Frankie. Um, there's there's a lot of good intentions. We heard a good good testifier, a person who's gone through it, and I do appreciate her sharing that. But as a, a lot of times we get these programs started, but then there's that long path that's not seen. So I'm troubled that we don't have these numbers in front of us. Um, because we want to make some, the reason we serve on this committee is to make real difference to folks in Minnesota, other, other uh, Minnesotans. So I would really encourage, and also encourage the author, I know there's people on the Senate side that would be um, interested in this and to, to start developing those relationships. I get it that the author is busy, but this is too important to let sit on the side. Um, my question goes with the greater Minnesota question with this increased funds um do do um is it knowing how much percentage would benefit in greater minnesota you know uh, the district i represent uh we don't get very far west any farther than what west i am on the western part of the district um so i mean are we just going that's always a concern i was just talking to a county commissioner this morning who called right at the beginning of the meeting and she has these concerns. Okay, great idea, but they always seem to stick closer to the metro area. We have real needs as an EMT. I pick up people with mental illness um, and these type of challenges. So just wondering um, when the author has the representatives been talking to departments and stuff like that, what's your take on that? What's your feel? You've been working on this. I would, would appreciate that feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Backer, Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. First, I, I wanted to say uh, briefly to uh, Representative Frankie that I agree with you. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and frankly, we do know that these programs have substantial ability to help uh, stave off costs down the road and to create better outcomes for the individuals. So uh, certainly creating a stable setting for funding is, is utmost in our mind. And, and I'm sorry we were not able to fill in that blank before we came to this committee. Um, but rest assured, we most definitely will. Um, so we'll, we will take care of that issue uh, and, and get that addressed. Um, as far as uh, Representative Baker, um, I can't speak to the exact percentage that relates to greater Minnesota. However, I do think that perhaps um, uh, the doctor or uh, Ms. Abderholden may be able to have a little bit greater depth about uh, sort of how that interacts with greater Minnesota in some of the specific programs that are out there. Thank you, Representative Bonner. I will check with uh, Dr. Uh, Meyer Kalos or uh, uh, Ms. Abderholden if uh, either of the two of you might be able to have a little bit more information that you could add to that would help answer Representative Backer's uh, question. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I might, um, Sue Abderholden. Go ahead. So it's about 1% of the population, you know, um, and so if you think about, and you need to have a certain number of people to treat, right, to create the team and to have it be effective. And so that's why when we initially did the state legislation, we said that in rural Minnesota, you could use these funds for actual housing. We used to call them kind of Ronald McDonald's houses, right, uh, for people with mental illnesses, because it's an outpatient program, it's not inpatient. And so you need a place for the person to stay, um, and sometimes the family, right, to be able to engage in this level of treatment. Um, I also just want to mention that Senator Nelson is actually the author in the, has agreed to be the author in the Senate. So we, we do have um, a Republican senator uh, willing to and has supported this uh, bill in the past as well. Um, we do get a little over $2 million from the federal, uh, out of the federal block grant dollars. Um, that are also supposed to go to these programs. Um, and, you know, I think having a, a good accounting of exactly where those dollars went would also be helpful. Thank you, Ms. Abderholden. Uh, Representative Backer. I have nothing else. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Backer. Uh, uh, are there any, there being no further, dis oh, hold on. Uh, oh, that was Representative Backer. I'm just checking to make sure there aren't any other hands up there. Uh, there being no further discussion, I'll give Representative Bonner the final word. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, you know, I, I mentioned <clears throat> a little bit very briefly in the ending of my comments that, um, you know, when I took this bill on originally, um, I, I really didn't know a great deal about first episode psychosis. In fact, I have to confess, I was a bit of a newbie uh, to, to that particular issue. However, it never in my wildest dreams did I believe that at some point it would touch my family. Um, I will tell you that um, one of my nephews who I have helped raise over the years, a sweet, um, very thoughtful, child that that I love more than life itself um, to witness him suddenly feel a little bit untethered from reality to see him struggling um, was extremely painful and difficult for my family and we are a very tight family we stick together right there's it, it really does take a village and we've always had that opinion um, he is someone who has close ties to his family. And so, you know, to see that happen, even in our own family, um, really underscored for me the fact that, that, that this issue doesn't necessarily impact um, just one segment of the population. It isn't necessarily urban or rural. It, it really has the ability to touch any family. Um, and so it is why I feel so strongly and so passionately about first episode psychosis and really having that early intervention. Um, because like any other family, I certainly want him to have a bright and productive future. Um, as I know that our testifier here today, and I want to thank her for her incredible courage uh, to speak to her individual experience and what that's like. And as you can tell, she is bright and articulate and lovely and clearly has a bright future ahead of her as well. Uh, so I think there's real potential for us to make a difference with this. And I am sure that Senator Nelson is working equally as hard in the Senate. Um, I will certainly follow up on the status uh, that we have in the Senate. And of course, we will make sure to address uh, any other issues that came out during testimony today before it makes its next stop. Thank you, Representative Bonner. There being no further discussion, I'll renew my motion that House File 1929, as amended, be recommended for referral to the Human Service Finance and Policy Committee. Mr. Cross will take the roll. Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Frankie. Frankie, aye. Frankie, aye. Backer. Backer, votes aye. Backer, aye. Baker. Sorry, Baker, Baker aye. <laughs> Baker, aye. Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Hanson. Hanson, aye. Hanson, aye. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, aye. Katiza Watoon, aye. Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert, aye. Moeller. Aye. Moeller, aye. Pearson. Pearson, aye. Pearson, aye. Thompson. Thompson. We disappear. Okay. Uh, with 11 I there are, Mr. Chair, there are 11 eyes and uh, zero nays. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cross. There being 11 eyes and zero nays, the motion prevails. House filed 1929 as amended as a recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Bonner, for the, uh, presenting the bill. And once again, I'd like to thank our testifiers, particularly Ms. Grothwell, uh, for her courage and incredible testimony. Thank you all.